This is a story about a canoe trip down the Green River in southern Utah. It was the first night of an eight-day canoeing adventure down the Green River. The rainfly of my tent was removed and the sandman subdued. I rolled onto my back to see the moon directly overhead as it shone through the mesh of my shelter. The diffused stars twinkled through, still glowing bright as the sun was far from shining its light. Hi, I'm Mike, and this is Mike's Road Trip. Get off the road! All right. We launched our canoes from Ruby Ranch, a private homestead 30 miles south of Interstate 70 and the city of Green River. Our group of 16 camped at Ruby Ranch the night before, the first of four campsites along a 45-mile journey through Labyrinth Canyon. John Wesley Powell explored the Green River in 1869, and in his journal he wrote, The canyon has towering walls that are symmetrically curved and gradually arched with beautiful colors reflected in the calm waters. Our first paddle day was filled with exuberance. We were given some safety instructions, then paired up and dispersed among eight two-person canoes. With our camp gear weighing down the boats, it didn't take long for us to discover that any abrupt movements needed to be communicated with our partners. Otherwise, we would easily find ourselves floating in the river without a canoe. Soon, heartbeats slowed, and the escape from our chaotic lives began to set in. As the red canyon walls first appeared, it was as if we were entering a new world, one with no distractions, no cell service, and no demands other than avoiding the occasional sandbar. The river was utterly calm and flowed very slowly, at about two and a half miles an hour. There were no rapids or sounds, save for a paddle breaching the surface of the water on the occasional stroke to straighten out the canoe, or those magical moments when someone would break into song. Our boats were packed to the gills, full of food, camping gear, kitchen supplies, and more. Our guide, Lauren Bond, of the River's Path wanted to share her number one favorite camping spot on the Green River with us. The river, however, was low and the embankments were laden with mud. When I say mud, I mean it was more like a thick molasses quicksand that would envelop you to your waist if you stepped in the wrong spot which Lauren soon discovered when we came ashore to the port of the Three Canyons. Lauren quickly assessed the situation and determined that if we cut down some willow branches and laid them on the surface of the mud, that we wouldn't sink quite as far and perhaps could make it up the embankment to the camp clearing with all of our gear. The endeavor required all hands on deck, Despite knowing each other for less than 24 hours, we all just came together as a team, following our benevolent leader, cleanliness be damned. Several times during Operation Willow Branch, Lauren had proclaimed promises that our efforts would not be in vain. Needless to say, most of us were a bit dubious. However, after a couple of hours of mud reinforcement and hauling our gear to the campsite, it was evident she had not led us astray. Three Canyons is one of the most enchanting places I've ever camped. And while most people set up near the rendezvous point, a few of us wanted to explore a little before committing to a sleeping spot for the next three nights. I set up my little area in front of what is dubbed the Tree Arch, a unique phenomenon where a sturdy oak split, but refused to die. Over time, the tree has developed into an iconic spot that represents the unique beauty of this area. At mealtime, we'd gather in a circle and sing a song. 
This was a time of bonding, unity, and giving thanks for the events of the day. The circle would then move around a fire where we would enjoy breakfast or supper before sharing our thoughts on what had transpired throughout the day. Three canyons provided endless places to roam and explore. We hiked and explored both solo and in groups. One day I hiked to the end of one canyon where I had to traverse over large boulders and up dry waterfalls, pools of water punctuating the way. In my mind's eye I could see glorious waterfalls flowing when it rained, the rush of water creating smooth curves and arches that would be unearthed during the dry season. At the end of the canyon, I was met by a monolithic wall in an amphitheater-like setting created by nature. As I sat on a stone contemplating this amazing place while nibbling on a turkey and tomato and avocado sandwich, I thought I would bellow out to test the echo. Hello. The sound cascaded down the canyon like water and boisterously made its way back to me. The next day, Lauren led the group into another area of three canyons. She showed us a massive ledge she called the Grotto, which was almost a living cave but did not go very far into the mountainside. There was moss and other vegetation growing on the walls which were moist with water that dripped into a tributary that eventually made its way to the Green River. I was perched on a bluff above the grotto, and when everyone left, I was treated to a little flute concert by one of our other guides. Walking through the tree arch where I was camped transported me into a portal of wilderness, known only to the few who dared venture off into this remote backcountry so isolated from the rest of the world. There was the occasional evidence of man's prehistoric existence in this area. Petroglyphs peppered the canyon walls, telling stories known only by those of the ancient time. Otherwise, the land has been remarkably respected by its modern visitors, a welcome respite from the modern world. The absolute silence during the night was exceptional. The stillness was only broken near dawn when Monica, one of our guides, would begin playing the soft sounds of a flute to gently wake us. This was followed by the rhythmic, shallow beats of a drum. After three days in three canyons, it was time to continue our adventure downriver. When I packed up my belongings that last day, I gazed at Tree Arch for an extended moment, noticing for the first time that the bark at the top of the arch was very different, almost missing. In its place was somewhat of a smooth skin rather than beefy bark. Its brokenness was its uniqueness, its strength. I had a personal realization in that moment Rather than seeing people as odd or different, perhaps I should be viewing them as special, just like the tree arch. After a 12 mile paddle through more majestic terrain, we arrived at our campsite, our home for the next two days. We had to contend with some mud again, but it was much more manageable. This was another fantastic camp spot with oak groves providing shade, privacy, and places to hang hammocks. Someone even found this really unique spot to pitch her tent, which was nestled within the cliff where part of the face had fallen. I am on day five of an eight day canoeing excursion down the Green River with the folks from the River's Path. And today, I have hiked up to this mesa and I'm going to see if I can get all the way to the top of the bluff here or the canyon wall. I still have all that way to go. Whew. It's quite vertical now. I'm trying to keep the sun off me. Well, I'm making good progress. Just have that bit. Nope, that bit to go right there. 
Well, I may have come across an obstacle I can't overcome. There's this ledge right here, and it wraps around the, the butte. Without taking unnecessary risks, I may be at the end of my road here. Wow, what a climb it was though. I love doing stuff like this. Now comes the not so fun part, <laughs> getting down. After two more glorious days, our next paddle day would be a big push, nearly 20 miles, and would take us around six hours. We stopped about halfway at a large sandy bank to take a break for lunch. Some wandered a bit, while others threw a frisbee around. It was some much needed relief from sitting in those canoes for so long. Later that afternoon, we arrived at Two Mile Campsite, our desired spot, which made it three for three. This was yet another great camp spot with a large sandy beach, perfect to set up the kitchen and friendship circle. While most everyone gravitated toward the landing area to set up tents, I found a way to navigate up to a higher ridge, and in short order, I found an incredible spot for my tent, overlooking the river in both directions. I was elated. My only disappointment was that there were no trees to hang my hammock. Soon after arriving, a group of pack rafters, packable kayakers, landed at the same camp spot, but they were soon hiking up the hill past my tent and would camp on the other side of the bluff. Unbeknownst to us, their leader spoke with our leader and provided some unsettling news. That evening, the bells rang, signaling that dinner was about to be served. As usual, we joined in a circle, sang a song to the river gods for the meal, and moved over to the ring of chairs on the beach with the fire in the middle. After the sun fell, it typically cooled off quite rapidly, but not on this evening. It was unusually warm and pleasant. After we finished our meal, Lauren announced some housekeeping items to share. She told us that the river guide who had come ashore told her there was a significant storm front coming, likely the reason for the warm evening air. The mood had changed and we were all very tired from the long paddle day. Many of us were tired after Lauren shared the news since we had to get up early to pack and try and beat the impending storm front. While I was disappointed by the news, I wanted to make the most of the waning hours in this magnificent place. It was a lovely evening perched up on that cliff. I laid awake in my tent with the fly off and the door open so that I could take in the extreme dark skies and super bright stars. Jupiter was particularly bright since it had not been this close to Earth in over 70 years. I felt so far removed from society full of peace and tranquility. The next morning we were on the water by 9 a.m. The river was calm and the skies were bright blue. Despite the deceptively looking day, Lauren took the precaution to have all of us tie our boats together with the boat beside us to create a pontoon of sorts and give us more stability in case the water turned turbulent. Just 15 minutes later, the winds picked up and began to make the water a bit choppy. 30 minutes later, and around the next bend, we were hit with significant headwinds that forced us to do some serious paddling just to move forward and stay straight. The river had completely transformed herself from a loving, docile creature to an angry animal. Here we were experiencing the full range of emotions of this living being. We didn't have many miles to cover, but it was clear it was going to take us a while to reach Mineral Bottom, the takeout point. The winds and waves continued to pick up. Our boats were filling with water, our feet submerged in ice cold. Hands ached and blistered from holding on and stroking the paddles so hard. Around one bend, the wind pushed the boats up against the embankment and we started to all pile up. The lead boat was stuck, pinning the other boats in place. Adrenaline was running high, but we stayed in fair spirits. 
When we finally made it around the last bend and could see the takeout in sight, we were met with an obstacle. The river had apparently shifted from a storm several weeks earlier, and there was now a massive sandbar blocking the takeout. Lauren had gotten out of her boat onto the sandbar to have a closer look. Thankfully, a deviation was created and a narrow passage of water was on the other side of the bar. But to access it, we had to continue downstream, then turn 180 degrees and paddle into the narrow estuary that would take us to the very end of our paddling journey. The next few hours, we packed up loaded the canoes, and drove back to Moab. By the time I got back to my hotel, the pitter-patter of rain started. After nearly eight days, a hot shower never felt so good. By that evening, a full-blown thunderstorm was raging. The hill out of the canyon from the takeout point is very steep, and had we not left when we did, we might have been stuck camping in the rain and muck for a couple of days. Our journey, like that of a river, changes course over time. You can either go with the flow or learn how to surf. No matter how hard we fight the current, we will never go back to the point we want. Therefore, the only way we can change our current situation is to move forward. The present is the place where we can create the foundations of the future. Escaping the pressures of everyday life for a week with no outside influence or distraction is a prescription for well-being. Giving ourselves time to self-reflect is an imperative for a life well-lived. The bonds created, the collective consciousness shared during this canoe trip is something I will treasure for a lifetime. Hey, thank you so much for watching and listening. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, please hit that like button, and don't forget to subscribe for more road trip travel adventures. So until next time, we'll see you on the road.